to the Mary Whitehouse Experience. And in case any of you were wondering, I am Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> and this is Punt and Dennis. <laughs> right, the producer, Bill Dare, brother of Dan and Dr. Kill, um, <laughs> asked us to do something topical so we can track its salmonella poisoning. <laughs> and in any case, we'd far rather talk about the weather. Long gone are the days when hurricanes blew across the southeast and the Oscar for worst weather forecast went to a fish called Michael. <laughs> The warm winter has also produced a plague of rats and slugs, most of whom are writing for Sunday Sport. <laughs> Under the channel, the greatest boring device since Noel Edmonds continues to drive towards France as the tunnel proceeds. <laughs> as you may know, Mr Tony Ridley, who used to be in charge of the London Underground, is now working for Eurotunnel. If the two halves of the tunnel don't meet in the middle on time, he will simply install loudspeakers to say, Mind the gap. <laughs> Yeah. The company building the tunnel is still insisting that it will be finished on schedule. They also swear that Trick or Treat will get a second series. <laughs> Meanwhile, protesters are worried that terrorists will be able to use the Channel Tunnel to bring into Britain lethal weapons such as Brie or Camembert. <laughs> the drive for European unity in 1992 continues apace as Britain struggles to meet European standards on the environment. They're much stricter than we are on public health dangers and are already pressing for an end to the Eurovision Song Contest. Similarly, the drive to cut noxious emissions from car exhausts has led to several noxious emissions from the Prime Minister, who is now definitely going for the green vote. That is, voters green enough to believe she gives a toss about the environment. <laughs> but the Queen... The Queen, meanwhile, has had all her cars converted to run on lead-free petrol. The nation's wildlife is now waiting to see if Prince Philip will convert his 12-bore to lead-free shot. <laughs> And the rest of us look to the Department of the Environment to see if they might arrange us some lead-free tap water. <laughs> the water privatisation is especially controversial, since the French seem to be most interested in buying our water industry. You'll know when your water board has been subject to a take-over. Your bath, your bath will be fizzy with a twist of lemon. And now we come to the Brit Awards, the only awards ceremony whose title is actually rhyming slang. <laughs> As a piece of classy television, this made Blind Date look like Edge of Darkness. <laughs> Mick Fleetwood proved that as a presenter, he is a tall drummer with a beard. <laughs> Education Secretary Kenneth Baker was there and was booed, mainly because he was one of the few people in the hall old enough to have a chance of a number one single. <laughs> He was actually there for political reasons, to point out Samantha Fox as the best argument yet for having reading on the national curriculum. <laughs> Ross won an award for Best New Act. No one knew what their prize was, but with any luck it might have been three raw eggs. <laughs> Still, the Brit Awards at least deserve some credit, if only for being the only BBC programme not to feature Clive James. From one Australian to another, last week Rupert Murdoch announced a bid to buy the Monopolies Commission. Also last week, also last week, academics were worried about cuts in university philosophy departments. One of them was reported to say, I think I'm unemployed, therefore I am. Talking of which, last week inflation went over 7% and unemployment went under 2 million. The news about the jobless came in a great ejaculation of headlines spattered all over the newspapers. By contrast, the inflation figure was allowed to leak out slowly on a Saturday evening, a sort of <laughs> nocturnal omission. <laughs> in future, news which the government doesn't really want anyone to know about will simply be put out on Sky Channel instead. <laughs> which still has fewer dishes than there are safe ones to eat. Finally, a story from last Thursday's Daily Telegraph. The real James Bond, a bird watcher after whom Ian Fleming named his character, has died in Philadelphia, aged 89. At his funeral, the hearse was chased at 90 miles an hour before the coffin turned into a hang glider and disappeared into a volcano. <laughs> Cast your mind back to February the 19th, round about 11.30pm. Pub throwing out time. Were you near the junction of Kilburn High Road and Wilson Lane? 
If you were, you may have noticed an affray involving two men. One of the men was aged around 30 and wearing a brown leather car coat. And the other man was me. <laughs> if you have any information about this crime, please keep it under your hat. You could win yourself a Community Action Trust reward paid directly from this wallet, which incidentally was lifted from a man in the Portobello Road round about midday on January the 3rd. As a homage to last week's British Rock and Pop Awards, we'd like to present the Skin Video Awards experience. Hosted, of course, by the Lazarus and Rip Van Winkle of Rock, from the Rolling Stones we give you Ronnie Deadwood and Bill Hyman. Actually, it's really great to see young people getting on. Well, it makes a change from you getting on young people, Bill, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> and the first band to play absolutely live, uh, apart from the pre-recorded backing tracks, actually, is a singing duo all the way from Scotland. Yes, it's Rock and Roll's Archers of the Crankies. It's the fabulous Proclaimers. <laughs> And in we are the poor face claimers It's hard to believe it but we're quite famous Ochtermachty is our favourite word And we look like brains from Thunderbirds I use the guitar and sandpaper voices Lots of guitar and really stupid noises I did it up, I did it up Oh whoa 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 Bobby no more Kenneth no more, Dudley no more, Thomas no more, Jackie Onassis no more, General Zia no more, Roy Orbison no more, Hirahito no more. Oh yeah, fantastic. Uh, moving on now, we have the Bob Hoskins Diamond Geezer Award. And the winner is Phil Collins for his portrayal of Buster Edwards, the genial cockney psychopath. Here's Phil. <laughs> oh, my name is Buster Edwards. Gav, I run a little flower stall. I gave some to a train driver. I sent them to his funeral. <laughs> oh, I can't stand violence on TV. I love it in real life. I beat up any basket who looks twice at my wife. And of course, there's been a tie for the Newcomer of the Year award. In joint first place, we give you Junior Doctor and the Medics. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and we're running out of beds. I've just come off a 95 hour shift. I'm completely out my head. How much is that kidney in the window? The one inside that Turkish blow. And of course, there's that marvellous rap artist, Salman Rushdie, MC. Listen up to my satanic verse. They want to change my company car to a hearse. When the Ayatollah says, I'll kill you, that's what I call a, a bad, bad review. review. <laughs> uh, all right, well, uh, hello, uh, my name's Jonathan Ross. Aha, uh -huh, all right. Aha, all right, thank you. And, uh, aha, all right. <laughs> well, uh, flubba, lubba, 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 lubba. Uh, uh, flub, 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 Aha, all right. <laughs> well, uh, I've just dropped into the Mary Winehouse experience uh, for you all to have a listen to this sound. <laughs> that was the sound of me earning a thousand pounds, all right. <laughs> Now, uh, please welcome another sound, the one and only Mr. Mark Thomas. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, this is the section of the show where I get to, to discuss a topical issue of my choice uh, with you. So what we want is a sense of involvement, a sense of intelligence, but also a sense of individuality. So after three, I want you all to shout out your IQ numbers. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three. Two, three, <laughs> Oh dear, we have a member of the cabinet lying in it. <laughs> the rest are just woodwork teachers. <laughs> um, what, what, I, what actually caught my mind was, um, I don't know whether you noticed, but the, the, the Five Nations Rugby Tournament was on. Now this is a remarkable event. 
How many, how, how, first of all, how many people here play sport? How many people, do you, just put your hands up in the audience. Oh, you over there with the, oh, that's a, quite a nifty little lot of peroxide you put on your hair. No. <laughs> I think you're about probably responsible for an enormous amount of, of pollution. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just shout out to the mic. What? what? Kempo. Oh, good. <laughs> you... Fast you are. Okay, no more questions. <laughs> uh, I'm not mucking around with him. They don't pack me enough. That's fine. So we've got all these sports. Does anyone here actually play rugby? <laughs> the question actually normally takes a couple of seconds to get through to the players. <laughs> Do I play rugby? I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually an amazing game. Whenever I see rugby players, I just want to shout out. I just want to go, Darwin, come here. <laughs> the missing link. Cop hold of this. <laughs> because it's, the only difference between a rugby player and a baboon is the baboon shows its ass less. <laughs> At all, yeah. It's amazing, they're all running around these fields with the numbers on the back, which is the IQ. They're all running around. Well, what actually distresses me about the game of rugby, I don't know whether anyone agrees with this, some of these people are doctors. Some of these people are, are architects. Policemen. Pardon? Some are policemen. Some are policemen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was good, that was a little blue Peter heckle there. <laughs> You joining in? That's what we want. What is very uh, what I want to ask is how many women in the audience would actually trust a gynaecologist who, on his weekend, stands on tables with someone else's knickers on his head, singing four and twenty virgins? <laughs> can, can we actually take a vote on this? Can I ask how many women in the audience would actually trust that person? We'll have the nose first. How many people wouldn't trust a person like that? No. Oh, just a few. <laughs> of you are going, okay, I'll put my feet up in the stirrups if you do another round of Zulu Warrior. <laughs> How many women would trust him? Oh, not at all. So about a quarter of the audience aren't actually women, they're just wearing comedy breasts. <laughs> well, actually, what I actually want to find out is, is why do you think they play that game? Does anyone know where the game came from? No. Well, I'll tell you. Um, well, the game actually came from the, the public school, rugby. And what happened was this young, um, sort of six, seven, eight-year-old uh, was playing football, and he got hold of the ball and started to run with it. And that's where the game came from. No, that's, where, that's actually where the game came from. But mind you, if you've got 250 public school boys bearing down on you, going, get the fag, debag him, debag him. <laughs> You're going to pick it up and run with it, you know? Yeah. So, the actual shape of the ball came from when they extracted it from him, I believe. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, let's have a few more opinions. Does anyone here, uh, has anyone got an opinion why people actually play rugby? No, no, not me. No. Go on, have you got any opinions? Uh, uh, not at the minute. Oh, I just thought that was a Buddhist chant starting off. <laughs> Go, we want a few opinions. People, just have a think about why you... It's a good excuse to stop pretending to be intelligent. It's a good excuse to stop pretending to be intelligent. That's brilliant. That's the kind of stuff we want. That's the kind of heckle we want down here. That, that is a, a good excuse to stop pretending to be intelligent. Oh, blimey, that one's taken me on a curve, that one. It is, it is, because... I think one of the reasons they play it, I think one of the reasons is kind of like, it's ritualised violence. Um, sort of in the similar way that the January sales are. <laughs> oh, dear, 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 dear. Um, actually, so let's, let's take a quick vote. How many, how many people think that um, rugby is an excuse for men to run around holding each other? All those who think that it is, shout yes now. Yes! All those who think it isn't, shout no. No! Oh, no, we had a couple of rugby players. We found them now. <laughs> Good night. And now, the public information experience. There's a threat to public health which is now rife in our society. It threatens millions of lives, and yet it is only recently that the full horrors of it have been made public. We are, of course, talking about food. <laughs> Eggs, cheese, chicken, and now pork. Factory farming is producing a new and dangerous super bug. Which Bernard Matthews is hoping to market as his new super bug roast. <laughs> 
it will actually be the only food that hasn't got any superbug in it. The only way to survive, therefore, is to stop eating. Just say no. Or at least to practice... <laughs> or at least to practice safe eating. Safe eating? <laughs> safe eating means making sure that no part of your food comes into contact with any part of your body. So it's out of the frying pan and into the toilet. Don't share your partner's noodles. <laughs> and avoid high-risk areas such as the larder or Shaggy from Scooby-Doo when he's making one of those towering sandwiches. <laughs> a multi-storey lettuce and he, like, he puts it in his mouth in one day. Areas where you are safe from food include wimpy bars, Casey Jones and the Bernie Inn. <laughs> But we do advise you to steer clear of Bernie Winters. Yes, Bernie is known for eating absolutely anything. This makes him a high-risk group. It might also explain why nobody knows where Mike is. <laughs> or Schnorbitz. Now, the papers say it's all hysteria, not listeria. But what do the farmers say? My name is Farmer Bumpkin. I plough the fields by day. Like my grandfurs and me mumfers, I farms the natural way. Then along came the man from the drugs firm with his pharmaceutical charms. Since we've been using his chemicals, it's turned into a funny farm. Now the lambs go moo, the cows meow, the dogs go baa. There's no taken out, but plenty put in on the funny farm. When you play with hormones, some you win and some you lose. All our turkeys, our souls, look like Bernard Matthews. <laughs> Well, our bread's just spade each day to make it look so lush. Our cucumbers are such a size, they'd make Errol Flynn blush. Well, the EEC subsidy, our green pounds we are counting. Oh, even Edmund Hillary couldn't climb our butter mountain. Well, the pigs have gone cold turkey, now they've started squealing. They grasped old Shep to the sheepdog trials Cause of his drug dealing Now the goats go woof The horse goes quack The ducks go woof 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 You don't need a vet Just a chemistry set On the funny farm Well the man from unsafe ways He says there is a panic So we leave the crap On the spuds and sprouts And label them organic Now don't lose sleep Says the minister No need for concerning Cause if you reap what we have sown It won't be just the butter that's churning Now your dad goes, ah, your mum goes, ah, the kids go ah! There's no better way of cutting down on your life On the funny farm Hello, I'm the uh, Mary Whitehouse Experience Agony Aunt. <laughs> and I'm calling all people out there with problems. I'm here to help you with those problems, or at the very least to tell you to stop bloody well whinging <laughs> and get on with something constructive. I've actually got some real life problems and answers here from various magazines, and to be quite honest, some of the answers are pathetic. So I'll see if I can improve on them and have a jolly good laugh at the same time. <laughs> First of all, we have one of those heart-rending but desperately tedious epistles from Jackie. <laughs> Dear Sue, you must help me. I've got bad spots and my friends tease me about them. I've tried everything. What can I do? A bros fan. <laughs> well, to be quite honest, dear, as a bros fan, I think you've got off very lightly. <laughs> Natural justice dictates that you should at the very least have leprosy. <laughs> no ears and no legs. <laughs> And I spot a fundamental flaw in your letter. You say you've tried everything. You can't possibly have done. <laughs> I don't suppose you've tried hitting yourself in the face with a cricket bat? <laughs> or 
cultivating your spots to such hideous proportions that you can actually marry Luke, Matt, or the one that's always in hospital. <laughs> As for the advice dear Sue gives about spots, well, it's the usual crap about acne preparations and eating properly. And quite honestly, you'll have a lot more success if you eat the acne preparation. <laughs> and smear your dinner all over your face. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> and finally, I see so many letters from young people complaining about things that just aren't a problem, really. Here we have one from Just Seventeen. Dear Marushka, <laughs> my problem is that I've got hairy legs. My dad won't let me shave them because he says it will grow back quicker. I thought about waxing, but I don't like pain. <laughs> and who's it from? Yes, what a surprise, a Bross fan. <laughs> Several anomalies here, really, I think. Firstly, if you don't like pain, why are you a Bross fan? <laughs> Secondly, the average age of a Bross fan is seven, so you've got something genetically wrong with you. <laughs> and thirdly, what has shaving your legs got to do with your dad? If your father really can't put up with your legs the way they are, I would recommend amputation <laughs> for your dad. And you can tell him that it's all right, because if you do cut off your legs, they do grow back again very quickly. <laughs> Crime Stoppers urgently want to hear from you if you can answer any of the following questions. Were you in the Sydenham area last Wednesday? Did you talk to a man in a blue anorak? Do you know the way to San Jose? <laughs> Can you feel the force? Do you really want to hurt me? If you think I'm sexy and you want my body, come on honey, tell me so. If you really need me, just reach out and touch me and you could win a community action trust award. Now, there have been a lot of stupid rumours flying around in the tabloids recently. In its usual grubby quest for custom, the Sun, it seems, is quite happy to support almost anybody who wants to claim that they are Elvis Presley. <laughs> we thought it was time to put all this nonsense to rest, and to do that, we're very pleased to have with us in the studio tonight, Mr. Elvis Presley. Hello. Elvis. <laughs> Elvis, you did leave a lot of clues suggesting you were still alive, didn't you? Yes, I don't know if you know, but the middle name on my gravestone is misspelt Aaron, with two A's. And it should, of course, be spelt... Louise. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure the people at home just want to hear the king do what he does best. So how about giving us a rendition of Heartbreak Hotel? No, I don't know that one. <laughs> I like to do my own favourite song. Ah, are you lonesome tonight? Love Me Tender? Chill House Rock? No. I Owe You Nothing by Bross. <laughs> ah, uh, well, before you do, Mr. Presley, I must say I have noticed one or two changes in your appearance since the late 70s. Well, there's the breasts. <laughs> I said the changes. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I've lost a bit of weight. Uh, but you're enormously fat. I mean, that fundamentally is the basis of your claim to be Elvis, isn't it? Fatness? Yeah. Well, that sounds fair enough. So, can we expect a big live concert from you at Wembley this summer? No. Oh, uh, so, so what are your plans? Well, you can expect a big arse from me this summer. <laughs> Elvis Presley, still the king. Right, now it's time for our comedy serial. All cosy at home in the family house. Ah, oh, what a lovely house. It's so snug and cosy and lovely and cosy and snug. Oh, 
I do like pressing the doorbell. <laughs> it's such a reassuring sound. Hello, Mother. Hello, son. I do so like being in the one family. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My, that armchair looks comfy. Don't sit there. That's your father's place. Hello, Mother. Hello, brother. I'm at university. Ooh, that armchair looks comfy. It's, it's your father's place. <laughs> oh. <laughs> dear, oh dear. For a moment there, we were sounding a bit like our stereo system, which is just one of the many things which we own. Oh, hello, darling. Hello. I've just reversed into the bloody garage. Where's my tea? Oh, you grumpy old so-and-so. I suppose I am, really. <laughs> How much is the house worth now, darling? Still a lot. We've had to convert the basement so that your mother can move in. Otherwise, she's going to a home. Darling, are there any black people in the world? <laughs> well, let's have a look. No, not one. Oh, good. <laughs> Samantha, why is that rugby shirt you're wearing ten times too big? It's to make me look about three years old and still daddy's girl. It would break his heart if he knew I was menstruating. <laughs> but you're 37. <laughs> I'll get it. Darling, do you know, just seeing you standing there in your Wellington boots and your garden shears makes me feel so comfortable. All right, I'll just go and get them then. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Vicar. What brings you here? I've no idea. <laughs> I think I have to appear roundabout now to reassure everyone that the outside world is peopled not with hoodlums and lunatics, but with vicars. <laughs> also, it rhymes with knickers. <laughs> well, suppose I'd best be off now then. Okay, thanks for dropping in, vicar. Goodbye. Blimey. What on earth else is going to happen? Well, once this crazy palaver is all sorted out, I should think we'll all breathe a huge sigh of relief. And then, just when everyone thought it was all over, Mr. Frobisher from next door will come round with the pair of wife fronts that Father lent Mrs. Frobisher to clean her windscreen with, but that Mr. Frobisher found in her glove compartment and got the wrong idea about. <laughs> That'll be him now. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll sort this out. He's not the only person whose wife I've led pants to. <laughs> hello, Mr. Frobisher. God damn, hello, Mr. Cozy, huh? Who's been a naughty boy then, huh? Here's Johnny. <laughs> yes, Mr. Frobisher from next door is Jack Nicholson with a chainsaw. <laughs> That means that next week's episode of All Cozy at Home in the Family House can go one of three ways. A. The Cozies get brutally massacred. B. The vicar comes back with some of his pants and everything is all right. Or C. Something else happens suggested by you. If you have any suggestions, please write to The Mary White House Experience, BBC Broadcasting House, W1A1AA. We will use the best idea. In return, the writers will send you one of their kidneys, redeemable for £4,000 at any private hospital. <laughs> Listening to the Mary Whitehouse Experience. It was written and performed by David Badil, Rob Newman, Joe Brand, Skid Video, Mark Thomas, Steve Pump, McHugh Dennis. The producer was Bill Dare. <laughs>